I worked as a big firm lawyer for about eight years. I quit nine years ago. And I vividly remember the last day I walked out of the office. It just felt like any other day, like I would just walk back in the next day. But I never did. I never practiced law again and I don't miss it. But I've never really spoken about why I quit law. It feels a bit weird knowing that some of my former colleagues will probably watch this video. But I want to make this video for people that feel stuck in their law career yet bound by golden shackles. And for those that are thinking about studying law. And one thing I want to get out of the way before we even get started is that this is not a law industry bashing video. I grew a lot as a lawyer. I worked with amazing people. I learned really valuable people skills and analytical skills. I also worked with some big name clients, which is pretty cool. So I'm really glad I have that experience under my belt. But when I decided to study law and then later face some challenges in my career, there weren't many resources available to me to guide me. And I also didn't know anyone personally who had left law and then started a new career for themselves. So to me, leaving law felt very scary. So I'm hoping that sharing my experience and the reasons why I quit law might be helpful to some of you out there. So if you're new here, my name is Peter Cook and on this channel I normally publish videos about intentional living, minimalism, living more slowly, that stuff. But I think my interest in living with intention is rooted in my experience as a lawyer and the life I lived back then. As a former lawyer, I still love a good structure. So before I get into the reasons why I quit, I'll first share why I decided to study law in the first place and the type of law I practiced. Then I'll share the reasons why I quit my job and finally the obstacles that I had to overcome when making the decision. So feel free to skip around, I left timestamps in the description below. When I was in high school, I didn't know what to study next. So I did this career assessment and it's basically this test where they ask you a bunch of questions about your personality, your values, goals, dreams. They test what you're good at. And the outcome for me was that law might be a good fit. Now, I didn't know much about law other than what I read in the newspaper about criminals. Uh, I probably seen a few John Grissom book adaptations, The Firm, The Rainmaker, but that was about it. But what I liked about this uh, advice was that with law, I would keep my options open, unlike studying history or language, which, you know, these studies are very specific. If you study history, you know, you don't have that many options other than becoming an historian or maybe uh, teach history. In the Netherlands, where I'm from, law is not a graduate study. I never understood this undergraduate graduate system where you first have to do four years of biology or philosophy something completely unrelated to law before you can move on to law school and you're raking up study debt in the process. Thankfully, I could go to law school immediately after high school and I did really well in my first year. I passed all my classes, I got good grades, but then I started to slip in my second year. I played guitar in a band, I had this secret dream of being a rock star one day, I was partying a lot, drinking a lot, and I was also trying to figure out who am I? So as a result, I was falling behind with law school. What saved me was that I went on exchange to Canada. I studied at the University of Western Ontario in London. It was really good for my English. I remember at some point I wasn't translating in my head from Dutch to English anymore, but thinking in English instead to conserve brain power. Really cool to observe. There was also this class I really liked. It was called Entertainment Law. It was taught by the lawyers of Nickelback. Now Nickelback is the most hated band in uh, the world. But I thought it was really cool to have this class taught by these lawyers that represent these big bands. And I also worked for a pro bono clinic. I represented this lady who was accused of paying with counterfeit money in four different shops. And I even got to go to court on her behalf under supervision. But still, it was really cool. Law really came to life for me during that exchange. When I came back, I got my act together. I only got good grades from then on. I did really well on my thesis and I developed an interest in intellectual property. At that time, IP was mostly practiced by small niche law firms, but I wanted to work at a big law firm. And there were only a few law firms, big law firms, that still had a legit IP practice. I was lucky enough to land an internship with one of them, and that was just so interesting. Instead of, here's a book, learn the whole thing, and then do this exam, now I had to pick up that same book, but find the answer to this specific question of a real client. 
So a funny story about that internship is that that was the last time I ever smoked a cigarette in my life. Now, I'd been a smoker throughout law school, but I quit about a year before that internship. I would still smoke a cigarette occasionally though. So it's a Friday afternoon and his partner walks into my office and uh, I've been working a lot for him. And he said, Peter, you know, I'm here on Sunday. You can totally say no to what I'm about to ask you, but I could really use your help on Sunday. So if you're willing to come in, that would be much appreciated. So of course I said yes, because I was there, there to get a good rating. Sunday, I'm working all day long. I feel like I do a good job. So it's 5 p.m. I'm about to go home. And then there's this voice in the back of my head that says, wow, it's Sunday, you worked so hard, you deserved a cigarette. One year after I quit, that's the mental addiction for you. This partner was a smoker, so I walked up to him and I said, can I please borrow a cigarette? And of course he gave me one. So I go outside, I had a coffee, my cigarette, I light up, I smoke about half of it, and then I just had to put it out. I was so nauseous, like I was just sick to my stomach. So I went back in and I literally had to lie down on the floor. I just couldn't move. That's how sick I felt. And I was just praying that this partner wouldn't walk into my room and ask, you know, what's going on? So, but this, this was a good reminder. Every time I craved a cigarette after that, I just thought back to that moment and it has helped me to remain a non-smoker ever since. So I had this plan to go backpacking in Australia for one year after I finished law school. And I had it all figured out. I had saved up about 80% of the money I thought I would need and I was going to supplement my income with fruit picking, working in a bar or a restaurant. I had a subscription to an Australian magazine. I borrowed a bunch of guides about Australia from the library. I even went to an Australia fair. I was really invested in this plan. but. My plan was to first apply for a job at a law firm and then once I got a job offer, I would just put this on the table and try to negotiate starting after I returned from Australia. But when I actually got a job offer from one of the big law firms I had set my eyes on, I never even brought it up. So I got this job offer and a couple of weeks later, I was a lawyer and not a backpacker. I did travel to Australia for about four weeks on a holiday, one and a half years after I'd started working as a lawyer but it was bittersweet. It was an amazing trip, but at the same time, it felt like a teaser to a movie I never got to watch. And I'm sharing this because it played a role in why I quit my job eight years later. So for my first three years, I was a trainee and I did two departments, M&A, which stands for Merchants and Acquisitions, and IP, which is Intellectual Property. And I remember my first week, it was all so new to me. I was so green and I had no clue what was going on. I remember sitting in my first meeting and they were talking about reps and warranties, uh, due diligence, SPAs, which I now know stands for Share Purchase Agreement. I had no idea what was going on. I figured I'll just zip it and I'll ask my roommate when I got back. But I picked it up quickly. M&A is long hours, but I really liked working toward a closing date with a team and the shared responsibility I got. Sometimes it was hard, sometimes it just plain sucked, but we were all in it together. And there was the added bonus of an annual ski trip. We had a bar where we would end the week every Friday night. And there were the annual parties. It was pretty cool. My second department was IP. And how it worked is that after three years, it was up or out. And about 50% didn't make the cut. Luckily I did. And for the rest of my time in my firm, I worked as an associate in the IP department. But in reality, that still meant I did M&A work for 50% of the time. Because when a company is being sold, the M&A lawyers are in the lead, but they need the expertise of the other lawyers at the firm. And employment lawyers, they check the employment contracts. Banking lawyers, they check the loan documentation. And IP lawyers, they go over the trademarks. You get the idea. Where things went south for me was when I was asked to volunteer as an in-house lawyer for one of our biggest clients full-time. It was an IT project at an insurance company. Now, this project had 80 people and a cowboy mentality reputation. They didn't have a lawyer on the team, so the legal department forced one on them. Me. So I wasn't particularly welcomed, and it was a struggle from day one. I remember it took three weeks before I even got a pass to enter the building. I had to call somebody for almost three weeks to come open a door for me. And it took almost as long to get access to the internal computer network. I had to figure everything out by myself. It was like I'd been thrown into a pool, except the pool was an ocean and I was all alone. 
I did bond with some people, but we all hated working on that project. And one thing I personally struggled with was the constant noise. At my law firm, I had my own room. And law firms are very quiet because everyone is doing high-level knowledge work. But here, we're on this open floor with 80 people and a lot of people are on calls. I just couldn't concentrate. It was a real nightmare for me. Even though I didn't like it, I sucked it up. I did my job to the best of my capabilities and kept everyone happy. I saw it as taking one for the team and hoped that it would help build my profile at the firm. What was supposed to be a three month job was extended to six months and then another month so I could train a colleague to take over. But when this colleague called in sick after just a few days on the job because she couldn't handle the pressure, everybody panicked. My first thought was, wow, now you finally see how tough this job has been. But the second thought was, they're probably gonna ask me to pick up again. And they did. At the time, I was a yes man. I didn't know how to say no. So I agreed to pick up where I left off. But I negotiated that I did not have to go back to that open floor, but I could work from the law firm, from the quiet of my own room. But then a few weeks later, when I was reviewing an IT contract for this client again, and this is a very vivid memory I have, I thought to myself, I can't believe I'm doing this work again. And in that moment, a headache started that would not go away for one and a half year. So the most important reason why I quit my job as a lawyer is that I had a burnout. I had really bad headaches for one and a half year. Not migraine, but this bad pressure on the side all the time. I may make a video specifically about my burnout one day, but for now I want to keep it focused on why I left law. After working 50% for a few weeks, my doctor recommended that I stop working altogether. So I didn't work for a few months. And then I tried again. I started with a four hour work week, but it wasn't the kind that Tim Ferriss wrote about. And I built it up to 12 hours per week. But you know, and that's nothing, but it was too much for me. So I had to stop working again. This was a very depressing time. Like I felt like I was doing everything I could, anything I could think of, I would try out, but nothing seemed to help. I was getting depressed. My life felt like it was in shambles. I couldn't read a book for more than 10 minutes before the headache would just get too bad. I remember being at a birthday party and there were a couple of conversations going on at the same time while I was talking to my mom. And as my mom was talking, like my head just felt like it was exploding because I couldn't zoom out of those other conversations that were happening and zoom in on the one I was actually having myself with my mom. So I had to say to my mom, please stop talking because I can't listen to this anymore. And my world was getting so small. Going to the supermarket was an event. I tried so many things. I started with going to the hospital to have an MRI scan done of my head. And I was concerned that maybe I had a tumor or a cancer. Luckily, that wasn't the case. But then the only thing the doctor could offer me was pain medication. And I was like, well, that can't be it. Like, there must be a cause. I want to get to the root of it. I don't want to be taking pain medication for the rest of my life. So I went on this journey of exploration. I did so many things. I started with a psychologist, a physiotherapist, but I also tried Alexander Technique, craniosacral therapy. I did a 10 day Vipassana meditation retreat, trigger point therapy. I volunteered as a dog walker for a year. I, I just went on a lot of walks. I went to the gym a lot. I did a 10 day juice fast. I mean, and that's not even half of it. You name it, anything I would hear of, someone would recommend it to me. I was like, let's do it, let's go, I'll give it a try. So I started saving a lot of money because I figured eventually my firm is gonna fire me and what am I gonna do? In this state, I cannot apply for a job at a different firm. I'll be flipping burgers at a McDonald's. That's really what I thought was gonna happen. So yeah. A minimum wage, I can't pay the bills, I can't pay my mortgage, so I gotta build up a buffer. Luckily, through a lot of trial and error, like some of the things that actually work, I think especially trigger point was something that I really benefited from, and the headaches started to get less and less. And at the same time, I started to put in more hours, I started working again, and even got back to working full time. Something that I almost wasn't expecting anymore, and I think if I'm honest, my firm probably also wasn't expecting. 
because when I was finally like fully back, they sat down with me and they told me, listen, Peter, it's probably best that you start looking for another job. You'll, you can work here until then, one to two years, but you're not getting any promotion anymore. And I, if I'm honest, I can't really fault them for it. If I was in their shoes, you know, I probably wouldn't trust my health uh, either. So I had to answer this question. What do I want to do? Do I want to keep working as a lawyer at a law firm or maybe work as a company lawyer or even do something completely different? I didn't really know. I still, you know, had these two years of depression weighing on me that clouded my vision. I didn't really know if this was something I should keep doing. But what I did know was that I didn't have to work at McDonald's after all because my headaches were finally gone and now I'd saved up all this money. So what I decided to do instead is to quit my job as a lawyer to travel for one year in Southeast Asia. It was this dream of wanting to go to Australia that bubbled back to the surface. But by now I'd been to Australia and I would no longer qualify for a working visa. So I figured let's go to Southeast Asia instead. Take some time to do soul searching, reflection, and yeah, just be away from it all. And then really sit down Maybe we're sipping on a coconut on a beach watching the sunset and just ask myself, like, what do I want to do with the rest of my life? So I did quit my job and traveled to Bangkok and then other parts of Southeast Asia. And I realized there were other reasons why I quit my job as a lawyer as well. So in hindsight, the burnout and being able to travel for one year, maybe you could argue that it was a blessing in disguise. But if anyone had actually told that to me while I was sitting at home with these headaches, I would have punched them in the face. And still, till this day, like I am more sensitive to sound than I was before these headaches. But there's one thing I can say, and that is that it's been nine years since I quit and I never went back to law and the headaches also did not return. A while back, I did this personality test. I believe it's called DISC and apparently I'm a harmonizer. I do my best to have a positive mindset and I just feel best when things flow. I mean, I like Beach Boys harmonies and major chords on a guitar, but law often involves conflict. Let's say the percentage of problems an average person has is about 10%. I'm not talking about how to assemble an Ikea chair or how to make blueberry pancakes without burning them. I'm talking about serious problems. Now, as a lawyer, you have your own 10%. But then you have to deal with the serious problems other people have and they put on your plate. So in my case, I would say 80 to 90% of my time was spent problem thinking and most of those problems weren't even mine. And solving those problems was often a zero sum game. I wasn't doing mediation. I was there to serve the interest of my client. Now, if we could find some sort of middle ground that was a win-win situation for everybody, that of course was preferable. But ultimately, my interest was to serve my client's interest. It came in two flavors, prevent any legal trouble from happening in the future, or if they were in legal trouble right now, get them out of it. A big part of my job was advisory work. That could be anything from drafting contracts in terms of service, to doing due diligence or writing a legal opinion. I was paid to think of anything that could go wrong and then future-proof our client's interests. When it was too late for that and my client either wanted to go to court or they were sued themselves or they received a cease and desist letter, it became more about winning. Now, I do have a competitive side to me. I like to win and I was very motivated in these cases to get the best possible result for my client. And if we didn't win, I would be upset. But often I was also thinking, someone is just being petty here and that's why I'm spending so many hours on writing this legal document either a statement of defense or a reply to the cease and desist letter. Or sometimes I was writing the cease and desist letter myself, but I wasn't fully behind the reason why we sent that thing in the first place. I'm exaggerating a bit. Most of my days were actually pretty uneventful. But all that analytical thinking, taking a skeptical look at everything, worrying about missing something important that could backfire, it took a toll on my mindset. There's not a lot of heart in law I found. And I, often I wouldn't come home feeling that my day mattered, that the work I did mattered. And I just didn't want to work in that environment for the rest of my life. One thing I missed working as a lawyer was knowing that my work contributed to something bigger. I didn't see the full picture. 
at least when you're a company lawyer, for example, when you work for big companies like Apple or Nike, you know, you're part of the bigger machine that creates these amazing products that they sell. Maybe as a company lawyer, you draft the hardware warranties for the MacBook Pro, or you draft the retail contracts for retail sellers of Nike shoes. But you can go into the store and you can actually see a MacBook, an iPhone, or Nike shoes. And, you know, you are part of the machine that helped put these things in these stores. I never had that feeling. Oftentimes, the people I worked with were either C-suite execs or head of legal departments, and they would outsource this specific legal problem. And the scope of my work was limited to that project. So I would write a legal opinion, I'll give my advice and send it back to them. And I wouldn't really see how my work fit into the bigger picture of what was going on at that company. And I missed that. I wanted to be part of operations, maybe be an entrepreneur even. I wanted to see the full picture. I really like technology and we're living in such an amazing day and age for it. I remember in high school, I had this job delivering papers and for a whole year, I delivered those papers so I could buy this bulky computer. I bought a 486 SX25 with four megabyte of RAM and 260 megabyte of hard disk space. Now in history class, I had to write a thesis. I chose Che Guevara and I wrote it in MS Word on that computer. But you couldn't just drag and drop pictures and I did, the internet wasn't even a thing at the time, not where I was living at uh, at least. So I had to go to the library and copy pictures from these different books and then measure these pictures and then leave white space in Emma's Word for these pictures so that when I printed the thesis, I could glue the pictures there. Now we've come a long way since then, but law is not at the forefront of technology. And it's no surprise, it takes a lot of time to create and then adopt legislation. In 2013, when the iPhone 5S came out, we were still faxing documents to the court. Faxing. Technology is developing at lightning speed and law is playing catch up, but it has an important role to play in protecting everyone's interest. I mean, privacy is a legitimate concern. Just look at the Facebook, Cambridge Analytica data scandal. Um, I'm really happy with Europe's GDPR, which stands for General Data Protection Regulation. But it's a double-edged sword. I'm really annoyed with all these cookie walls whenever you go to a website. I mean, is that really necessary? They don't add anything. I really like what Lana Blakely tweeted about that. Asking to accept cookies before I've entered the site is like asking to like and subscribe before I've had the chance to watch the video. And when the printing press was created, it now became much easier to copy books. So copyright laws were then created to protect the interest of authors to incentivize them to keep writing books. As a society, we benefit from their creative output. But these days, you could argue that IP owners actually stifle creativity. They have the money and the manpower to lobby for their interest, whereas content creators don't. And they have the deep pockets to follow through on any IP infringement claim that they make. So someone who's accused of IP infringement may actually have a really strong case from a legal point of view, but it never gets to that point because they can't afford to go to court. So long story short, I no longer wanted to nitpick over legal intricacies of technologies that were invented five years ago. Instead, I want to work with technologies that came out today and do cool things with it. The last reason I quit is that, if I'm honest, I find law quite boring. I remember when my law firm closed one of its oldest offices, they made a book to commemorate it. And it had an interview with the two founders of our firm, whose names were still on the outside. They were now in their 80s, and one of them would still come in every week to the law library to catch up on the latest case law. My jaw just dropped when I read that. I'm like, I just could not imagine that in my retirement, I would go to a law library and read through all these boring law magazines that have no pictures, just text, and it's not easier to read either. And just read that for fun. I read that because it was my job and I think I was pretty decent at it. You know, I would write a writ of summons, a season the sis letter, or even an email. And you know, doing that well, it's an art. And I feel I really developed that skill. There's this famous Slaughter and May markup about eating hamburgers together. I guess the lawyer drafted it up for fun. It starts with, I want to eat burgers with you. 
but then quickly turns into this long page with all kinds of legal qualifications. It shall not be construed to mean that I want to eat a burger that has you in, on or under it. There's a whole paragraph on what at the same time and in the same place means, and it ends with a note that the draft is not ideal, but it's the best they could do given the complexity of the subject matter and the completely unreasonable deadline. It's hilarious, especially for someone like me who knows where the lawyer who drafted this is coming from. But I haven't missed law one bit since I quit. I missed many things about my job, but not the legal stuff. I missed the analytical thinking, the working in a team, working uh, to meet a deadline. But for those things, you don't need to be a lawyer. You can also find those in other jobs I found. So those are the main reasons I quit my job as a lawyer. However, it wasn't easy to make that decision. There were many obstacles on my way. Giving up that steady monthly paycheck was by far the biggest obstacle. From day one, a lawyer makes a really good salary and it just gets better as you climb up the career ladder. Even if you never make partner, you probably make more as a lawyer than in any other job, even compared to company lawyers. So that's difficult to walk away from when you're not really enjoying your life so much anymore as a lawyer. And you get used to it, you adjust your spending habits. Now you go for this fancy leather sofa instead of that cheaper IKEA alternative. Brand the clothes, going out for dinner more often, a nice car, a mortgage. There's a name for it, it's called the golden shackles or golden handcuffs. And I had multiple colleagues who complained about not liking their job anymore, they were daydreaming about doing something else, but they were shackled because of their spending habits and they couldn't downsize. It was difficult for me too, but what helped was that I'd build up this cushion because I thought these headaches I had would never go away and I would be flipping burgers at a McDonald's at some point to pay the bills and pay for my mortgage. So when my headaches were finally lifted from me and I could function normally again, I decided that I could now use that money for something else. I could use that to travel for one year, which was a dream I had always had. So that made it easier to quit my job. Another thing I struggled with was not being able to call myself a lawyer anymore. I had started to identify as a lawyer. I didn't just work at a law firm, I was a lawyer. My whole world revolved around being a lawyer. I worked way more than 40 hours a week, I worked weekends, a lot of my friends were lawyers or bankers or accountants, which you know, is more or less the same thing. We all worked in these big towers at the central business district. Although I would never admit it at the time, I secretly enjoyed that status. Not that any of my friends were impressed, but I was the only lawyer in my family. And still, till this day, when I meet new people, I introduce myself and then the topic comes up and I mention I used to work as a lawyer in the past, their eyes light up. It's like people have this preconceived notion of what it's like to be a lawyer and I think the same for being a doctor. It's just a special profession, I suppose. But it's a bit weird for me now that I don't work as a lawyer anymore. I guess they have their own image of what it's like to work as a lawyer from seeing it in the movies or watching Suits. Now that we're speaking about Suits, there's one thing that really annoys me about that show. It's all the walking. The elevator door opens, Mike comes out, and hey, by pure coincidence, there's Harvey. So they're walking together, they're talking, and hey, now Lewis joins. Now there's three people talking and walking until they get to Harvey's office and then boom, that just also happens to be the end of the conversation and they all go their own way. In the real world, a lawyer's job is pretty boring. Most of a lawyer's time is spent behind a computer and writing emails, doing calls or drafting legal documents. Now, I know that doesn't make for very interesting television, but having worked as a lawyer and then seeing suits, it's just a bit too much for me, all that walking. But that attachment to my job, identifying as a lawyer, it made it difficult to quit. So that's one reason why when I quit, I spent some time traveling so I could really figure out after I created distance from that role, who am I if I'm not a lawyer? And what do I want to do? Do I miss law or do I not miss it at all? And if I don't miss it, what do I want to do? And who do I want to be? So if you're considering leaving your job, whether it's in the legal profession or a different industry, I recommend taking some time off first, like a holiday, and weigh the pros and the cons in this different environment. 
it's hard to make that decision when you're going to the office every single day. Another roadblock on the way to closing the law firm door behind me for good was all the time and energy I invested into this career. There's a fancy name for this, sunk cost fallacy. In a nutshell, it basically means that once you're invested in something, you're likely to follow through on it, even if that's a bad decision. The term sunk cost refers to all the time, money and energy you already invested and can't get back. In my case, that was going to law school and working as a lawyer for eight years. It was scary having to start over. I felt I didn't have any leverage and didn't have any skills other than working in law. But when I had my burnout, it really forced me to reconsider and I made the call to quit my job as a lawyer and try something else. The final obstacle I faced before quitting my job as a lawyer was guilt. My dad dreamt of being an architect and he was one for two years until he was made redundant. He was unemployed for two years and then he finally got a job again, but he was working at a contractor and not as an architect. And for the rest of his career, he worked for different contractors and even architect firms, but never as an architect. And it ate at him and I could feel that tension at home. And here I was, I studied law and contrary to my dad, I actually had the job I went to law school for and not just any job, I worked at a big law firm. So by all accounts, I had it made. What was I complaining about? What could possibly be wrong? I wasn't consciously connecting this to my dad's career journey that came later. But when I think back to it, at a subconscious level, it definitely played a role. I didn't want to disappoint my parents. They had put me through law school and they raised me well and they just put me in the best possible position to be successful in life. And that's why I never said no, even when I was overwhelmed with that IT project that kept being extended. When life wants to teach you a lesson, first it knocks on the door gently. Then when you don't open, it knocks a little harder. But ultimately, if that door stays closed, life will open it with brute force. You learn the lesson the hard way. And in my case, that lesson came through headaches. It's now been nine years since I last practiced law. When I traveled Southeast Asia, I met these people that lived there. They were working remotely as digital nomads. I'd never heard of the term digital nomad at the time, but I was intrigued and I decided to become one. So since then, I have done different things, some successful, some unsuccessful. I've worked for a couple of remote work companies and now I also do YouTube, but I've never practiced law since. I don't know where this journey will take me, but I do know that I'm much happier these days and I also feel more fulfilled. I have embraced philosophies like slow living and minimalism, and they've just really opened my eyes about what makes a good life. These are lifestyles that focus on cutting away the things that are just cluttered that you don't really care about to make more space for the things that you do care about. So you can live a more happy, more fulfilled, more joyful life. Now, if you want to learn more about that, one of my most popular videos is called What is Slow Living? Slow Living for Beginners. And you can watch it right here. So thanks again for watching this long video and staying with me all the way to the end. I hope to watch you in the next video and take care. Bye.